event is going to educate you about the value whistleblowers bring to effective enforcement of the U.S. sanctions that are holding Russia at bay and stopping their um, incredibly violent invasion attempt in Ukraine. So this is going to inform you about the way whistleblowers can use important programs at the IRS or at the um, under the Banking Secrecy Act to disclose information about financial crimes that are happening around the world. I'm joined here by some very prestigious and highly esteemed attorneys, and one of them is my friend and colleague, Matthew Benningfield. So National Whistleblower Center is so happy to be joined by Whistleblower Network News and co-sponsoring this event, where we have these incredibly important and experienced experts. Matthew, please take it away. Thank you so much, Siri. Uh, happy to be here, and I'm, I'm really excited for the conversation today. It's not only an important topic, but like you said, we have a great group of experts, renowned professionals with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to go through the roster here and give some introductions. Uh, first up, we've got Dean Zerby. Dean's a partner at Zerby Miller Fingeret Frank and Jadav LLP. He's also a senior policy analyst for the National Whistleblower Center. He served as senior counsel and tax counsel for the Senate Finance Committee for then Chairman Grassley and was the staffer primarily responsible for the legislation that created what's now the modern IRS whistleblower program, which we'll talk a lot about today. Uh, thank you for being here, Dean. Up next, we've got Eric Hilton. Eric Hilton is the director of investigations at ZMF Law, along with myself and uh, Dean. He's got more than 30 years of experience with the government and he held several prominent positions at the IRS, including serving as the commissioner of the small and medium-sized small business self-employed division, excuse me, the deputy chief of the criminal investigations division. He was also the executive director of CI's head of inter international operations and the director of CI's narcotics and counterterrorism office. So quite a resume there, Eric. Thank you for joining us. Up next, we've got uh, Poppy Alexander, who is a partner at Constantine Cannon, coming to us from California. Uh, she represents whistleblowers and government entities in key TAM suits in both the federal and state courts, as well as under various agency whistleblower programs, including those administered by the IRS, the SEC, FinCEN, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and the Department of Transportation. Poppy, thanks for joining us today. Last but certainly not least is Jeff Neiman. Jeff is joining us from London today, although he's based in Florida. He's a partner at Marcus Neiman, Rochbaum and Pinero LLP. Uh, before his current firm, he worked for the DOJ tax division in the criminal division fraud section in DC. He also worked as an assistant US attorney for the Southern District of Florida. So everyone welcome. Thanks so much for joining us and we're excited to hear your great commentary today. Uh, yeah, I wanted to start kind of at a higher level, talking about the importance of whistleblowers, especially in this day and age. I mean, we have the war in Ukraine uh, that's you know, ravaging the country and, and sending shockwaves through the world in a variety of ways. And you know, as we all know uh, on this call that uh, you know, whistleblowers and informants, particularly in the financial fraud space, play a particularly important role uh, in times like today. So I wanted to throw the first question or topic out to Eric Hilton, who has a vast amount of experience abroad. Uh, so Eric, based on your experience and seeing the activities of kleptocrats playing out today, how would you describe the importance of tax whistleblowers and uh, you know, the accessibility of informants in this day and age? Uh, so, so thank you, Matthew. I appreciate the opportunity to kind of speak, and thanks to National Whistleblower Center for putting together such, I think, a fantastic panel. We've got some some legends here with Poppy, Jeff, and, and Dean, and, and so just happy to be able to join and kind of speak about, I mean, a truly important topic on tax day, you know, happy tax day, April 15th, right? And so, uh, but no, uh, I mean, obviously, whistleblowers play a critical, critical role in combating financial crimes as it relates to international corruption and all types of financial crimes, including tax evasion. And when I was, uh, and I, I look at whistleblowers as more of a true lever in the overall financial crimes ecosystem. And when I was the deputy chief for uh, IRSCI, as well as 
the executive director for international operations truly emphasize the importance and the use of whistleblowers because you're dealing with so many different opaque or uh, corporations and shell companies and different things of that nature, complex investigations. And you're really thinking about how do you find that needle in a haystack? And, and, and really thinking about, and for me as an investigator, I would prefer to have somebody to show me <laughs> versus spending three years looking for it. So whistleblowers are, are just are so important because the thing that I try to emphasize and how the importance of it and, and give you some real job satisfaction and satisfaction for whistleblowers as well is the fact that when I talk to, I used to talk to IRS special agents consistently and I say, well, yes, we're here to protect the integrity of the tax system. But we're also here to protect the integrity, the integrity of the US financial system. And with the world's largest economy, we're also here to protect the integrity of the global financial systems. And when you think about kleptocracy and international corruption and how they use bribery, how they use misappropriation of private assets, uh, you know, government assets, how they use embezzlement, extortion, and then try to exploit that through U.S. financial systems as well as international financial systems and laundering those proceeds, whistleblowers can help address that. We're as strong, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And as we think about, you know, Russian oligarchs and where we are, you know, right now, you know, there's estimates that Russian oligarchs are around, have assets of over a trillion dollars. You know, I mean, it's exciting to kind of see, you know, IRS, criminal investigation, working with hopefully whistleblowers and other agencies in regards to addressing that with the repo task force, with the klepto capture, and really looking at, okay, can we find that wealth extraction? Can we find some of those shell companies and different things of that nature so that we can uh, assist with this really, really important issue here? So. Um, but I, I know probably some other colleagues probably want to comment on that as well, though. Yeah, Jeff, let's go to you next. Uh, you, you spent some time with uh, DOJ. Can you talk to us about, uh, again, the importance of whistleblowers being able to communicate about international issues um, and really the relationship between Treasury and DOJ uh, in this day and age and, and how they're working together or, or not working together? Yeah, th thanks. And again, thank you also to the National Whistleblower Center for having me today. And I'm, I'm honored to be with, with, with my colleagues here. But look, I, I think behind every case is evidence. You can't bring a case, you can't seize an asset, you can't find a boat, you can't find a bank account, you can't put anyone in jail if you don't have the evidence. And the evidence is built with the help of the IRS special agents and tax cases, FBI, DEA, whoever may be, whoever the the, the special agents are investigating a case, and they are going through documents and talking to witnesses and trying to put together a case. And there is not better evidence than an insider who has turned and helped the government. That insider who is at the table having private conversations with the bad guys. The insider who knows where the bodies are buried, who knows all the secrets from the inside. And this is streamlines an investigation, it should be at lightning speed. Once you have that first crack, first look inside the window as to what really is going on in the criminal mind to then allow the government to go out there and find the assets, to then seize the assets, to then hopefully at some point reward the whistleblower for having provided this information. So to me, look, my almost decade working as a federal prosecutor, insiders were the key. Insiders are how we made cases. Insiders are how we got the government paid back money. And those insiders today are whistleblowers. And look, there are programs out there that we're gonna talk about that, that reward the whistleblowers for coming forward. Excellent. So Poppy, what about you? I wanna give you a, an opportunity on this, on this first question to kind of opine. Uh, you, know, you, you have experience uh, with international clients. What, what is your take on the importance of uh, these whistleblowers today? I mean, I really am just going to echo everything everyone just said. You know, we, there is nothing more complicated than money laundering, and there's nothing more complicated than sanctions evasion. All of this stuff happens by definition in the shadows, right? And it, the federal government 
is really hamstrung if they don't have someone shining light, showing them where to look. And they're frankly really hamstrung if they don't have someone at the very beginning of their investigation, just pointing them in the right direction from day one. And that's what whistleblowers can do by bringing that information forward, bringing it to the program, getting the investigation started, or at least you know helping it get off its feet. And, and that's what all of my clients do. And you're right, I have clients from all over the world who are working under these various programs who are you know, willing to take the risk to come forward because they know what's happening is wrong and they want to fix it. Um, and that's that's what a whistleblower does. And that's why we're all in this business. Thanks so much. And, and Dean, I'm going to go to you next. Um, you have a story history with the whistleblower program at the IRS. Uh, so for those that are listening today who might not know what the program even is or its history, can you walk us through, we're going to get a, bit, get a little bit more granular here. You know, what is the program? How does it operate? How did it start? I'll pass you the mic, Dean. There we go. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Matthew. And again, thanks to the National Whistleblower Center for hosting this. So the program, uh, creating the um, IRS whistleblower program, I was working for Senator Grassley at the time, was basically trying to build a little bit on the False Claims Act and its successes, uh, but to have it encompassed by um, encompassing tax. Um, and we had seen firsthand from our own work that having whistleblowers serve as Sherpas guiding folks through even for the committee's work was incredibly important and obviously helpful in the False Claims Act. So basically what the tax program does that was put in place in 2006, it says if you come forward with information that causes the IRS to take action against an individual that results in collective proceeds, meaning kind of dollars in hand, that you're gonna get between 15 and 30% of those monies collected pretty broadly defined. Um, the things I would say to you, probably for folks listening is they are, uh, you while you aren't anonymous to the IRS, in other words coming forward, they need to know who you are. You are anonymous in terms of the dealings within the IRS. The IRS is very good. Eric knows this better than I do at protecting your identity, making certain it isn't known. They'll never admit that they have a whistleblower. They'll never state to the taxpayer that there's a whistleblower. So they're very good at protecting that. They're also willing to, happy to take people that are from overseas as well, too. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen. So just kind of some basics there. And right, it just as to echo what my uh, other panelists have said, it's been hugely helpful, particularly in this area of more of the dark cobwebs of the world of offshore accounts, things like that. Brad Birkenfeld, uh, who was a client of mine, as many of you know, blew the whistle on the Swiss banking that basically overnight turned uh, upside down that world. Um, and they rewarded him. They gave him $104 million as a uh, uh, percentage uh, for the amount that they collected. So. Um, that's the basic framework of the program. I would say that one thing I noticed is that it was expanded with an amendment 7623C based on a case that we had won that made it clear that it encompasses any issue that the IRS investigates. So as you heard from Jeff and Eric well knows, the IRS investigates a lot on behalf of DOJ. They're kind of the lead dogs in terms of money laundering, all those kind of things. So it encompasses that as well, too. And just one last thought for you folks listening, and, and Jeff kind of touched on it in his comments. If you're thinking about this in terms of offshore, illegal, uh, you know, money laundering, all this, what the IRS is going to be most interested in is you're an informed insider. You know what it's about. You're, you're on the inside kind of guy. It's not just, well, I heard it at a bar. Two, docs. If you've got docs, that is joy without end for them. Three, that it's current. It isn't, well, you know, I heard this once back in 2005. You know, they want to, they want things that are current and, and up to date um, and involving real dollars. I'd say it's kind of a quick thumbnail for folks to think about, but that's, that's the program. It's, um, you know, it's not perfect, but they're, uh, they, they, put out awards and they go forward. It's a long process as uh, many of us on the phone know, it doesn't turn on a dime, um, but uh, it does uh, give out the money. So that's kind of a quick and dirty on the program. Thanks so much, Dean. And Eric, I'm actually gonna pop back to you uh, for the next question. You know, you were you worked for the IRS for, for decades really. Uh, and although you weren't in the IRS whistleblower office, I'm sure you, knew of its workings and, and you know, what those in the agency thought of the program and in the value of, of the program. Can you speak to that a little bit, you know, as an, a former insider at the agency? Sure. I mean, I mean, when 
when I was with IRS Criminal Investigation, I mean, and even when I was commissioner for small business self-employed, I wanted to form a solid, solid, sometimes unbreakable relationship with the whistleblower's office because recognizing whether you're talking about from a criminal standpoint or a civil standpoint, having that information is, is truly critical. You know, I, I'm extremely proud of, you know, the work that the whistleblower's office with the IRS has done. I mean, as Dean mentioned, you know, there's definitely some levels of, you know, for improvement and even, you know, try to expand that uh, globally as well. I mean, I even uh, had the whistleblower's office go out and talk to many of our counterparts throughout the world so that they can start it, you know, start a whistleblower program. And a part of that is really establishing and educating the whistleblower program office on, you know, what to look for. Dean touched on quite a bit of this. I mean, because in many of the cases, it is somewhat complex. And so you need some individuals to have a form or understanding as to what to look for, what makes a great case. You know, uh, you know, from, from an IRS perspective, you know, you're, you're talking about international fraud, I mean, international tax fraud or international corruption. And I think what is what is important, like right now, as we talk about Ukraine and the Russian and Russian oligarchs, and and I mentioned earlier the the you know how fascinating right now would it be to kind of work on this repo task force, the Russian uh, elite um, um, oligarch, no Russian elite proxy oligarch. You know, here here they come up with these acronyms, and you know, working with eighteen different countries and really thinking about how do you confiscate freeze and seize, as Jeff mentioned earlier, you need whistleblowers in order to be able to do that. And as we can see in the news, they've been, uh, I mean, probably, you know, been very successful. And I'm quite sure whistleblowers have played a part in that. Excellent. Well, Poppy, I'm gonna to go to you next. I mean, the IRS whistleblower program isn't the only whistleblower program where an informant can bring evidence of financial fraud. So can you talk to our listeners about what other programs there are and maybe their relationship uh, with one another. Absolutely, um, that's right. We in the US are really lucky to have an entire network of related agency programs that work together to cover as much of the world of financial fraud as we can. There are still holes in the system. We're, we're really hopeful that some of those are gonna get filled soon, but um, we're, we're doing pretty well. So. Uh, a really important one to know on this topic is the brand new FinCEN whistleblower program, which was created just about a year ago. The, um, the agency, the program is now up and running. And this program covers anyone with information related to a violation of the Bank Secrecy Act. The Bank Secrecy Act is that set of compliance obligations that every bank and a lot of other financial actors, as well as some institutions you might not think of as financial actors, but they engage in the trading of money and the trading of currency. Uh, all of those actors have certain compliance obligation. That's the sort of basic know your customer information that's in the case of dealing with people from high risk jurisdictions and certainly people from jurisdictions where there's a lot of people sanctioned, verifying things like source of funds, which is critical, of course, for making sure that laundered money isn't going through our system. Um, and then filing what we call suspicious activity reports or SARS on the other end, if they do in fact catch some sort of suspicious activity. Um, the FinCEN program is off to the races. They're doing great. The whistleblower office is eager for good cases. Um, and right now I know um, we're talking about it a little bit later on as well, but there's some, there's some really good proposals out there on how to strengthen that program. Um, and it's not the only program out there. There's also the SEC program, which covers you know, public companies and other companies under the SEC's jurisdiction uh, engaging in bad acts. And maybe we don't think about public companies being as involved in money laundering as they might be, but it's an important part of the ecosystem as well. Um, and of course, all of these agencies work together. They work with DOJ whenever there's a criminal comp uh, component to it all. And whistleblowers, when they bring us information, you know, our first job is to figure out what the best program is for them, or if there happens to be overlapping programs. Of course, you know, you can always bring the information to multiple programs, and we do with some regularity. Right. Uh, Matt, ahead, I just Dean. wanted to mention, too, uh, that's a nice overview, is Treasury and DOJ kind of came out like a bolt with their 
kleptocracy asset recovery rewards program, I guess with the delightful acronym of CARP as far as I can tell, but um, that's the program that made some news. It's about, a, you can do up to $5 million uh, if you've got information that basically helps them um, seize assets. I think it's an interesting program. How it interacts with the other programs is a little bit up in the air on it as far as I can tell. Um, but what I did kind of catch my eyes, I believe it would, uh, there's a lot of these award programs um, that probably went through in the IRS one. Uh, it's, well, they got to get the money in hand. In other words, okay, yeah, call me. You'll get your award when we get ours. I think this one, um, while it's more limited, they'll pay kind of, okay, we're going to pay you up front for the money or for the information. It, it at least seems that that is the possibility there. I, um, I don't want to kind of take too much time on it. I wrote for it on Forbes. If you want to kind of read, I put in a lot of nice links in there to kind of some details because DOJ and Treasury put out a lot of guidance on it. But I just mention it because it is, in terms of for today's discussion, the one right over the plate where they're uh, trying to do it. And I, I turn it over to my colleagues to comment and say anything. The, the one thing I would say is, again, you can find the, the, uh, the, the cloud instead of the silver lining, but I was fortified that the administration itself initiated it, but also kind of came forward with lots of nice statements and commentaries about whistleblowers, about the need for whistleblowers then to reward them. We can all remember it's, it, it's not a political point, any administration, it's kind of the teeth pulling to get them to say, yes, we love whistleblowers. Yes, we want you to come over and, you know, put out the beer and schnitzel for uh, the whistleblowers with the red carpet. And I, you know, I commend them for doing that here. You know, we'll see how it all works in the details, but at least an interesting start. And I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts or comments on that, that program. Not on that, but kind of on the culture, right? And I think that it, we are seeing what I hope is a change in the mindset within government as to the importance of whistleblowers and to reward whistleblowers to come forward with good information. Because it's these folks are put their lives on the line oftentimes. They put careers on hold, they put families um, in, in safety nests, and they come forward with what is really critical information, important information to expose bad stuff. And they put their faith in the U.S. government, whether it's the IRS or whether it's the SEC or whether it's the, the uh, new FinCEN program. They put their faith in the U.S. government to treat these people right when they take these risks to benefit the United States government and, and kind of punish bad. And that's what we're hoping for. We see this cultural change, this acceptance more to pay whistleblowers for their information because they are critical, as we all know. And you're, the government, I hopefully, is is say, seeing that more and more. Hundred percent. And and Jeff, I, I like what you said about you know this information is important. And you know what the government really is looking for is is actionable information. So you know, let's talk a little bit about what makes a good filing. I mean, with the IRS program, it's a Form Two Eleven. With the SEC, it's a TCR. I, I'm going to stick with you, Jeff, on this one, but. Uh, you know, Dean somewhat previewed this, you know, what, what is the government really looking for? You know, if someone is kind of on the fence about, you know, filing a claim, uh, they think they've seen something, they have documents in hand, you know, what makes a, a good, strong filing that, that could lead to success at the end of the day? Yeah, look, it, obviously, whatever, you need to bring everything you got, documents, uh, recordings, text messages, emails, and your goal is, I think, to rely on your representative to really kind of comb through it and turn whatever it is that the data dump into the most beautiful woven story one could ever imagine in order to make it easy for the government then to figure out where these assets are, what it is that they could potentially recover, how has how the fraud been exposed. The devil's obviously always in these details with how good the presentation is. I actually was talking with someone senior within the IRS not too long ago, and he says, look, you all think on the outside, it's like shooting fish in the barrel. The problem is we have so many barrels filled with fish, and we don't have enough people who can actually shoot the fish. There's, there's this resource issue on the other side, which needs to be addressed as well, which is how can we get the IRS the funding it needs to actively enforce the laws and go after the, 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 these tax evaders? So, so the information, I know I'm not answering your question head on, Maddie, but it really depends on, on the actual facts of the case. 
we can make them, we can make a pig look really pretty. There's no doubt about it. And whatever you give me, I promise I'm going to want more. I'm going to tell you, I need more. I'm going to make you work harder to get whatever you can because I'm going to push you because I'm, as far as I can push you to get information, hopefully the easier it gets for the government to connect some dots. If there are even dots left to be connected to go out there and seize the money and take the money. You're exactly right. I mean, I, you know, I tell my clients it, it really becomes a partnership when you're creating these filings and, you know, pushing them to bring as much to the table as possible. And, you know, once you kind of cross that line and, and you, and you bring forward the information, it really becomes a partnership with, uh, with the government and you're working with them to, uh, you know, relay the information accurately and, and fully. So Poppy, were you going to uh, add on? Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple of important points here um, that need to be emphasized, which is, you know, I have filed some cases with just gigabytes upon gigabytes of information. And I have also filed some cases where my client didn't have a single document. Uh, the lack of documentary evidence doesn't necessarily mean you don't have actionable information. People bring forward really important critical information uh, in all sorts of different forms. And it can certainly be information that you have about a scheme that does not involve a document. It's a lot easier if we have them, it's not necessary. And the other thing I wanna say is that, you know, our sort of traditional stereotypical view of a whistleblower is always that insider, right? The person who was in on the scheme, who has enough inside information to bring that forward, but that's not the definition of a whistleblower under any of the whistleblower reward programs that we have in the US. A whistleblower is someone with non-public information, and that person can be an outsider, that can be someone, an independent analyst, you know, who has done their own independent analysis and discovered something that the government hasn't discovered. The SEC whistleblower program was written for exactly that example in mind, and the other programs are as well. Um, so, you know, just, just because you're not an insider doesn't make you not a whistleblower. I think that's, uh, you know, it sometimes gets confused in the sort of common parlance. Yeah. Uh, and, I, mean, I think there's a tension with the, at least for the IRS, you're right, with the SEC, we've had a number of clients who've kind of done independent analysis. I find in tax world, they're a little bit hard-eyed about that. There's so many claims that are rejected because they're viewed as speculative and that they're like, well, I mean, I just think that they'd prefer if it's a continuum between, well, I was at this bar once and this guy once told me about his cousin who had an account overseas versus I'm the vice president at the bank and here's the thumb drive with all the names, rank, serial number, passports. You know, obviously that's, and I think we all agree that's where you want to be. But I think kind of going to the logistics, logistics of it and the challenge, Matthew, it's in, you do such a fine job on it, is I think it's kind of presenting in a narrative to the IRS, you know, in 10, 12 pages, here's what's going on, here's what's happening. So they can pick it up because there's a lot of triage at the IRS and it's kind of that tension of having someone be able to pick it up that's more junior to say, I get it, I get what's going on, I have. But having the details then to support at the, at the more senior levels, okay, here's where we are and here's what we're about. But it's also the whistleblower and it goes to your good point, Poppy, but sometimes you don't have the docs, sometimes you've left and you've got kind of a map with no names in your right and they can work with that. But I think that's where you, the whistleblower matters. I mean, so important in tax, particularly that, I'm a CPA or I'm a, you know, I have master's tax. I was in the tax department. I mean, somebody they're like, okay, this guy's got it going on because if you're a good point, Jeff, they do have limited resources. And for them to launch a thousand ships to go after, you know, company X, they better have a pretty high feeling that, you know, you know what you're talking about, that there's something there, there, because it is such a limited deal. So, but uh, yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah, and it, uh, so sticking to the topic of, you know, those who are coming forward, the informants, the claimant, whistleblower, whatever we want to call them, um, you know, the issue of unclean hands, you know, this group has talked about it a little bit before, but you know, Eric, I'm going to throw this one to you, you know, say you're someone that, you know, might have been in the mix, um, and you're wanting to come forward now and, you know, disclose what fraud, uh, you know, has occurred. Uh, how does the government really deal with those that might have unclean hands? And uh, should that prohibit folks from really coming forward with critical information. Well, you know, uh, thanks, Matthew. I probably would have kicked it to one of all the, I'm the only non-attorney on here. <laughs> but, you know, lucky you. Of, <laughs> say lucky me, right? <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that I, I think about and in, in that regards is the fact that if you do have unclean hands, get an attorney. 
you know, in, in some regards, because it, to some degree, you know, you know, that's probably the first thing you might want to think about and that you're sharing that story and then also being able to uh, get to DOJ. Uh, and so we can have some discussions for your for your overall protection and, you know, thinking about should a grand jury be uh, put into play, you know, obviously kind of thinking about it from a criminal standpoint. But I mean, I think that's 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 a critical part of, I, I've worked with, you know, uh, a number of individuals, you know, I, I typically used to call them more informants and, and, and it bleeds into whistleblowers, you know, uh, but that do have, you know, dirty hands, but, you know, really kind of making sure, you know, that they do have, have counsel as well. So, I mean, but well, you know, the only thing I would say to Eric, and you know, this well, and all of the listeners is, so the statute anticipates that particularly in tax, the statute is actually very kind towards this. I mean, there's a wide recognition that we want insiders and we're not going to get the people just going from choir practice to the Boy Scout meeting in terms of coming forward. So they're very used to people with dirty faces and, <laughs> and unclean yes. hands coming in and they get awards too. I mean, yes. I have- but, of, but look, I, 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 do ahead, think it's, I do think it's important when you don't want to give the government necessarily the rope to hang yourself either, right? Well, you're so, right. So, so you, need <laughs> yeah. to you need to balance this. And, and, and Poppy's 100% right. Some of the best whistleblowers out there are the analysts who like see something on the side and all of a sudden they're like, well, let me dig a little deeper. And they uncover that this, this company that says it is what it is, is not really anything at all. But, but this unclean hands is an issue. And I think you always do need to balance and figure out how to approach the government in the right way to avoid giving them that rope. And the number one rule, if you, do, if you open your mouth and you talk to the government, you have to tell the truth. You have to tell the truth, because if you don't tell the truth, you're, you're going to create more problems for yourself than anything else. So it's a, it's a, it's tricky when you are neck deep in the fraud, how to come forward with something that hasn't ever been exposed. It's a mitigation factor that the Justice Department should consider, and, and, but it's not automatic immunity from prosecution just because you come forward with this information. And it's something that, look, I, I do a lot of the defense work, and, and it's always in the back of my mind when I'm doing the defense work here, uh, whistleblower work, how do I handle it as a defense lawyer, as a, as a white collar defense lawyer? Well, I guess my thought is if, if you're made off, then I think, you know, you're in a different <laughs> deal. If you, I mean, the statute talks about planned and initiated. I mean, if you're third spirit carrier on the right, or you're, you know, typical for us to be, you know, I'm the vice president of tax and, you know, in a fortune 500 company, or I'm, I just, you know, I don't, I don't, you're right, Jeff. I mean, you've got to be eyes open. I just don't want to get folks overly that I think the government anticipates folks are going to, they want the person in the room when it happened to come forward. And, and that you're right, it's, it's good to have your eyes open about it. But I think it's also realizing that, uh, you know, their, their interest is, is, the, is the big boys. But well, we, we're going to talk about legislative changes potentially out there, but like the antitrust program, the antitrust division, it's not a whistleblower program, but they have a program where you're the first in the door, you get immunity. If, we, if there was a way to codify some sort of immunity or, or, or protection from prosecution, that would, that would be amazing, but, but they're just, it's not there. So therefore it's got to be on the mind. So we've talked a good, about, good bit about you know, what information is good and actionable and, and the, maybe the type of person that should be coming forward as a whistleblower, um, you know, that, that would lead to a success story. Let's maybe talk a little bit about some of the difficulties that, that whistleblowers face. And Poppy, I'm going to go to you first for this one. Um, so today is tax day. And, uh, you know, a lot of us on this call have uh, cases at the U.S. tax court. Uh, there have been some interesting cases that have come out as of late. Uh, so can you talk about you know, I, I always kind of break it down between the agency phase and, and the court phase. Uh, can you talk about the court phase a little bit and uh, the road ahead for, for some whistleblowers that might want to contest uh, the outcome of their case? Sure. So, you know, the tax program is a little unusual. It's different from, for example, the SEC program in that it's written in that whistleblowers have the right to contest the denial of an award or have the right to contest the amount of an award if they disagree um, with the IRS about it. And, you know, honestly, that's really necessary in the tax program, unlike the other programs, because the IRS doesn't talk to whistleblowers in the same way that other programs do. And that's truly just because I think the culture of secrecy around taxpayer information and such the IRS means that it's been very difficult for them to sort of 
learn how to see whistleblowers as a resource and as you know an extension of their own audit capacity, which means that there's not as much communication as you get in other programs. So we have the tax court mechanism to try to protect against that. Unfortunately, really just in the last few months, there's been some bad decisions out of the DC circuit that the tax division chief counsel's office is currently using to try to limit to some degree, the right of an appeal of uh, denial of award. And there's right now, there's a lot of action at the tax court around chief counsel's office filing even motions to dismiss different um, whistleblowers, you know, claiming their awards, claiming that actually the statute does not say what we all know it does in fact say, and um, that people don't have quite the same right, which is you know, truly unfortunate um, because a whistleblower really has no other way of knowing exactly what went on except for taking it to tax court, getting access to the administrative record, getting to see what actually happened and working with the IRS from there. You know, truly the best way to short circuit all of this would be to, um, to Jeff's point about, you know, potential legislative changes to get the IRS to talk to whistleblowers in a far more open manner um, then we wouldn't necessarily have to go to tax court in the same way that uh, I think a lot of us feel we do at the moment. Um, and that would save everyone a whole bunch of time and a lot of heartache, but that's unfortunately not the world we're working in right now. And Dean, uh, I, I know you, you have experience obviously with uh, litigating these issues. Can you kind of add on to, to Poppy's commentary there and talk a little bit about difficulties that, that folks might face? Right, I mean, in some ways, it's right, understanding the framework of the letter. Sometimes it makes sense to go to tax court, uh, particularly if you think that there's a question that they did take action. I mean, there's always keep in mind, there's three things you need to prove to win at the end of the day in tax court. One, the IRS got your information, provided information. Two, that they took action on the information and resulted in three collected proceeds. And that's kind of what the DC circuit is at the end of the day stating is you need to basically make those claims up front um, and how that's going to come out in the wash. But I think, you know, we've had success in the tax court. Um, I think Poppy's right. It, it'd be nice to avoid that in some respects. Uh, there is legislation put out by uh, my old boss and uh, bipartisan bicameral uh, legislation uh, led by Senator Grassley to uh, basically reaffirm what we thought was the statute when we wrote it, that it's a, uh, it's a de novo review uh, instead of an arbitrary and capricious standard, uh, I think we'll see action on that sometime here in the next uh, year, but it's trying to find a train that's moving in the Congress, so it's not that easy. But I think, it, right, it's not the best way to get confirmation, but it is your rights, um, and it's uh, cumbersome, but um, it's it's out there, and we've had success in it. Um, you know, ideally, you want to be in a position where the IRS um, is squared with you uh, to begin with. And I find in general, you know, that they are, we've obviously had occasions where they've gotten sideways or there's been a question of what the uh, treatment of the law is, but uh, um, it's, um, like I said, it's a, it's a happier day if you're getting your war letter and not having to go to uh, court, always, always the best uh, possibilities, but not always what you've got, but you do have that day in the court and, um, um, you know, that gives a lot of peace of mind to whistleblowers that they can at least get an independent uh, take on things. Thanks so much, Dean. And, you know, so just wanted to make an announcement for the audience. We got a little bit of a late start, so we're going to be going about 15 minutes uh, post the intended uh, end time for our Q&A. Also wanted to shout out uh, Dr. May Edwards, uh, FinCEN whistleblower in the audience uh, for attending. We, you know, I think we've got a lot of great people viewing this right now. So, we appreciate you being here, but you know, tagging on uh, to what, what Dean was saying and, and Poppy, some of the challenges that whistleblowers face. Um, you know, the IRS whistleblower program, the IRS recently announced that uh, Director Lee Martin has left his post um, at this point, I believe. Uh, so with this transition in leadership, I think it's a good opportunity to uh, reflect you know, on the history of the program and potential changes uh, that we might see down the road not only in the IRS program, but other programs as well. So Jeff, you had kind of opined earlier in the conversation about mechanisms that you would like to see. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with you uh, to kind of piggyback on Dean's comments regarding legislation that's out there now. I think he's referring to the IRS Whistleblower Program Improvements Act. 
and, and what you'd like to see. And then we'll kind of go down the line uh, for, for our wish list here as yeah. practitioners. Yeah, look, the National Whistleblower Center has, has done a great job putting forward some great legislative ideas. I know Dean works around the clock to try and make this program better, more efficient. Um, Director Martin did a did a good job growing the program. There's no doubt that we've seen tremendous growth, but I think this program has so much potential, and I'm anxious to see uh, who the new director is and see what level it can be taken to, because the skies really are the limits for this program. If I think we talk, have a little bit of this cultural change within IRS that, look, they're very good at what they do. They're the best in the world at what they do, but they could always use a little help. We all could use a little help. And, and, and I think they need to accept that and kind of move on. To me, kind of like my fantasy dream scenario type legislative fix would be if the existing key TAM statutes, which allow private citizens to bring lawsuits uh, against um, wrongdoers who, to recover money on behalf of the United States. Right now, it specifically says tax isn't allowed. Uh, I would love nothing more than, than to be able to file a criminal, a sealed complaint under, um, serve it on the United States government and lay out a tax fraud scheme and give the U.S. government the opportunity to, to investigate a case in the key TAM setting in a tax world. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't want to do it, I'll go put on my, 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 uh, my suit from the good old days when I was a prosecutor and I'd be a private litigant prosecuting tax crimes again, trying to get money um, on behalf of Uncle Sam and, and, and keep a portion of it for my clients. That to me would be like the dream scenario selfishly, I, I think I, I would really enjoy it because we all like the, the government job and it was a great job, Eric, I know you know that as well. Um, but, but at times it's, it's more fun on this side as well. And this would be the ultimate, for me, legislative fix is if we tweak the, the key TAM statute to instead of um, ban tax cases, allow them. I filed the key TAM suit uh, recently in the Eastern District of Virginia it, where I, there was a plea agreement between a, a financial institution in the United States government, which we thought was brought under false pretenses. Um, and the bank received a gigantic reduction in its criminal fine as a result of what we said was lying to the US government. And the US government quickly came in and said, nah, you're interfering with the criminal process, get out of our way. We're now taking that issue up to the fourth circuit. So like if we had some uh, key TAM legislation here that allowed tax private citizens to bring tax claims, they do it in the state of New York. Why can't we do it federally? It would be, it would be a lot of fun. And I think it would be very beneficial to this country. Poppy, why don't we go with you next? Yeah, I want to second that. Um, you know, uh, Senator Warren has made that proposal, and I think it's a fantastic idea to, you know, to create a tax key TAM at a federal level would be huge. And as Jeff said, we do have that for some state programs. We have it in New York. Pretty recently, we have in DC. Um, there's, you know, pretty much every year it's proposed in California. Uh, we haven't gotten it yet, but we're working on it. Um, these are huge opportunities and there's, you know, there are a lot of advantages to the False Claims Act versus the agency program, number one of which being, of course, that the whistleblower can pursue the action, even if the government says no, and can pursue it on a declined basis. Um, so I think that would do nothing but supplement the agency resources. And, and you know, to that end, I, someone said earlier, I think it was Jeff, you know, the biggest thing we could do to support the IRS right now would be to increase their funding. Um, they they need it. Uh, we all know they need it. They've you know, and they are completely hamstrung by the lack of funding. And it, the biggest thing they could do to help whistleblowers would be to give them the audit resources they need to look into all of the valid uh, whistleblower complaints that they get, and not have to make hard decisions about it. Let's go to let's go to Dean next. Thank you so much, Poppy, um, for your kind of legislative wish list. I know you kind of talked about that. A little bit before, but then we'll hop to Eric to kind of give us some inside baseball about the IRS and that need for funding that Poppy just mentioned. So I guess, like I said, we already have the IRS uh, Whistleblower uh, Program Improvement Act. That's got, I think, some helpful changes, particularly in regards to the tax court and standard review. I think, right, um, Bobby and Jeff both, both correct that the IRS is getting more funding. They got it in this uh, most recent budget and the budget before that. So that the trend line is going up for the service in terms of funding it. You know, every agency always wants to have more money, but they are uh, getting into a better place. And I think that's uh, vital for the IRS in terms of being able to do its work in general services enforcement uh, across the board. So I think we're seeing that and that's an improvement. 
7623A so there's the mandatory program that's out there and then there's the discretionary program one of the frustrations has been and I think one of the reasons so many people are going to court is that the IRS does not take full advantage of the discretionary program and say well maybe you didn't uh, rise to the level of a mandatory uh, award but you did still provide value still provided support and benefit that was of, of use to the IRS and we're going to give you a you know an award of say five percent uh, so I wish that you know, with the new team coming in, uh, they'll take a look at that. Um, I think getting into contracts, uh, the commissioner the other day in the hearings talked about, well, we're just outgunned by the other side. We're behind the eight ball with the other side. Well, that was the whole point. One of the critical reasons we had, and it goes back to Poppy and Jeff's points about the False Claims Act, is one of the benefits of the False Claims Act is you get this army of, of lawyers in there to basically assist the government in its work. And that was part of the idea here. And that's where at the criminal level, the IRS is pretty good at working with whistleblowers and their attorneys. On the civil level, you just don't have what we call 6103N contracts, which they think they need, where you really would basically, you know, take Jeff and uh, harness him to a desk and, you know, get him working on the government's uh, payroll, if you will, um, in terms of helping these cases. That's a cultural issue that I think, you know, maybe with a new director, um, that might get a, a new focus uh, that would be very helpful to get them to really take full advantage of the benefit of the program of bringing the whistleblower in on a continual basis. Too often right now, other than criminal, it's kind of a one-time, two-time discussion and the lawyers are kind of in the, in the background, and really fully engaging and harnessing the whistleblower and their attorneys and advisors to the system would be of, of great help on it. So I think those are all uh, things I'll kind of pause there and let Eric take it from there. He's got such a, a good knowledge and feel for all of this. No, no, I appreciate that, Dean. I mean, you know, I, I probably will touch on something that, you know, you guys have already done or touched on. I mean, it's from a resource standpoint. I mean, I was with the service for 30 years and I mean, and I felt like I, I used all my entrepreneurship skills and resources to try to come up with different ways to address issues, you know, with the limited resources that we had and the whistleblower office is no different. And I mean, really thinking about truly staffing that because of recognizing that the whistleblower office could be a true force, force multiplier in a lot of different compliance issues. And if we really staffed it correctly, and then also have, you know, a lot of subject matter experts that's coming in from the civil side to be able to assist some of these complex uh, you know, claims that have come in. I mean, you know, some of the things that, you know, that I've seen, I had this, I've been doing this for 30 years. I still have to scratch my head a little bit and say, all right, let me look this up. Let me look that up. I mean, so, I mean, it, it requires, you know, that expertise, you know, the service has lost a third of its workforce over the last 10 years. And, you know, so that is truly challenging as you think about some of these emerging issues that are coming about, you know, just to think about cryptocurrency right now. I mean, you know, should, you know, thinking about, you know, how that has just morphed into so many different areas, you know, and obviously not just from a policy standpoint, but, you know, using cryptocurrency to hide their funds, you know, offshore. We talked a lot about, you know, crypto and, and, you know, uh, international corruption and different things of that nature and using uh, virtual currency as a way to kind of hide those funds, you know, is the service really adept within the whistleblower's office to handle some of those things? I mean, we have to stay on top of some of these emerging threats and, you know, crypto is just one area as well, so. Thanks, so thank, thank you so much, Eric. And I, I wanna make another quick announcement. Uh, we've got a lot of great people in the audience, including John Christmas, uh, a money laundering whistleblower. You know, I really wish we could engage more with our audience members uh, and have them kind of talk about their experience, but maybe there'll be a, an event for a later date. So, uh, so now we're gonna, we're gonna quickly move to our Q&A session. We'll probably only have time for one or two. Um, but the first one uh, was directed at Poppy. Um, the question is, some experts have noted that FinCEN is just overwhelmed with reports, kind of going off of the topic we were just talking about resources. Um, question being, you know, is do you think more funding is needed for the agency in that program? Yeah, FinCEN is unfortunately a really underfunded agency, just as the IRS is. And, you know, I, I hope that this moment is teaching all of us how important that agency is and how we need to dramatically increase its funding. Um, and I think it is. I, I do think it is. I think this is not a blip. I think we're witnessing a sea change in how people understand how bad a problem hidden money 
is and you know what an issue we have with not only sanctioned individual and kleptocrats but just generally um you know there's there's too much money hiding in the shadows right now and we need to fix that and fincen is in fact the agency to fix it so yes i think absolutely we need to focus on expanding their resources um, I think also, you know, it's a brand new agency. It's a, excuse me, brand new agency program anyway, not new agency. Um, we don't even have regulations yet. All, you know, as, as they get off their feet, as they sort of put in place all of the same sort of structures we see in the other agency programs, that will help. Um, and they will help them feel a little less overwhelmed. Um, so, you know, it's still very early days for the program, but so far they're really off to a great start. Excellent. Thank you so much, Poppy. And, you know, last question for us today, just because of our time crunch here. Uh, the question from audience member was, uh, you see, what, what do you see the media's place in whistleblowing being? I mean, you, have you guys had clients that you know, work with media, um, you know, race against time to file something when, when the media has the story themselves? Uh, you know, Dean, I'll start with you and then we'll kind of go down the line quickly. Right. And I just encourage for folks listening, I apologize for the time, obviously, for all of us, I'm sure if you have any questions, you'll feel free to still send them in and we'll, you know, get back to you one way or the other. So don't be shy or disappointed if you didn't get your question in on that. I, I would say to be candid, I, even though I work with the media a great deal and, you know, worked in the Hill, I have a lot of clients who are like, let's go call the New York Times, let's go call, you know, Senator so-and-so. I'm a little bit leery that my panelists may disagree and have their own views and that's perfectly reasonable too but I kind of want the agency to be able to do its job I'm pretty focused on let's get the agency their best best product let them have a chance to look at them I don't if I'm an agent I think it's just human nature to say well that's funny now I'm reading about this in the papers plus it gets a little bit dicey if they say oh well yeah it wasn't the whistleblower who told us this we, then we read it in the New York Times you're like oh no but I was a source for the New York Times yeah, well, welcome to a, a certain circle of hell as you try to unwind that and, and claim your credit for the award. I, I would encourage caution in that. I, I like to let the agency work, try to get them to go forward. Sometimes that can happen for the reasons you mentioned, Matthew, that maybe they've got it. Uh, then, yeah, I want to I want to get there the first is with the most is with the agency. If you think the media is coming forward separately. But in general, I, I, I like to kind of color within the lines, work with the agency and try to give them a fighting chance, but others you know, may have their own journeys or experiences. Yeah, I'll just jump in real fast. I, I agree with you, Dean. I, I think you go to the media and Congress as a last resort. I think when you are taking your client to Congress or you're taking your client to talk to the New York Times, you're doing it out of frustration. You're doing it out of frustration because the government hasn't done what you believe the government should, should have done. So, so I think you've got to give the agencies its chance to investigate. You don't want to step in front of the agency. They, at the end of the day, uh, or who you want to be able to collect money, right? <laughs> yeah. If they don't collect money, then you're, you ain't getting paid. It's that simple. And they're the so, ones so, deciding it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but so, so I use the media and Congress as a last resort when you just aren't getting traction, when you aren't getting attention to the case that really deserves it. I, you know, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, with the, with the caveat that what we say is our, our job is to give the agency everything they need to get their job done. And usually that means staying quiet and not tipping our hand to what's going on. Occasionally, there certainly have been circumstances where investigative journalists, independent of us, have you know uncovered some piece of the story that we didn't have and our you know no whistleblower is expected to know the entire soup to nuts story whistleblowers always know a part of it and that's great that's fine that's what the program anticipates and sometimes you do have situations where the media can supplement the story and can sort of fill in some blanks and when we're then able to bring that information to the agency as a supplemental submission um that can actually really help um and i think you know, our, our jobs are not all that dissimilar from investigative journalists at the end of the day. And, we, you know, we really see us as all part of the same fight of trying to, you know, uncover dirty money, trying to stop corruption. And uh, I just have a huge amount of respect for the work that they do. And there certainly are circumstances where we can all work together to help the agency. All right. Well, thank you so much, Poppy. And, and thank you to the rest of our, our panelists as well. Uh, I'm going to do a quick lightning round. We covered a lot of ground today, uh, a lot of interesting topics and really great discussion. So I appreciate you guys being here. 
So, you know, I'm going to go to Eric first, just to kind of give a last word uh, about the value of whistleblowers and the importance of even conversations like this. So, Eric, I'll toss it to you. No, just, just quickly, I mean, hey, we truly support whistleblowers. I mean, feel free to come in and, and share your thoughts and the information that you have. I mean, and um, we're here to help. All right, Dean? I think same thing. We're always, our phones are always open, always happy to talk to you. I think you'll find that the general trend has been more pro whistleblower, encouraging whistleblowers to come forward. And it, particularly at this time, uh, in the kind of the dark money, the dark secrets, there's a, a very strong appetite and interest by the government that we've seen in that. So uh, I think the welcome mat's out there. So Jeff, how about you next? Yeah, look, I think we have only only to go up from here to be honest we've come a long way already but the sky really is the limit like like we we, we have just so much potential in these programs that it, it's it's a fun to be a part of it's it's the most exciting part of my practice which is pretty darn exciting from time to time so it, 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 we leave it at that all right and last but certainly not least poppy um you know i'm gonna echo everything everyone just said whistleblowers the government is definitely throwing out the welcome mat and you know we haven't even gotten a chance to talk about some of the congressional proposals that are out there right now to expand uh, the FinCEN whistleblower program to create a floor for awards, things like the Enablers Act, which would expand the scope of the program, you know there's there's a lot of really positive signs right now that the government recognizes the value of whistleblowers and knows that there's no way we're going to stop dirty money flows without them so come on down. All right. Well, thank you again to our panelists. Uh, Siri is not able to rejoin the call right now. So I just wanted to plug uh, the National Whistleblower Center and thank them for putting this uh, esteemed panel, as we've said before, uh, together. Uh, you can visit their website at www.whistleblowers.org. We appreciate everyone taking the time to join us today. Again, apologies for the brief delay, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, all. Cheers. Cheers.